Hi, I'm Joseph Velasquez. I'm from Austin, Texas. And I'm here as artist in residence here at the uh, John Michael Kohler Art Center in Sheboygan. Uh, here I am the artist in residence uh, for the next few weeks leading up to the big uh, Midsummer Festivals of the Arts here in Sheboygan. I'll be uh, accomplishing a few community projects culminating into our final steam uh, roller block printing. So right now I have two three foot by five foot woodcuts that I've been working with uh, in the community for the last three weeks and carving along with giving some printmaking demonstrations, wood carving, screen printing demonstrations, and sharing uh, my love and process of printmaking with the community. Can you explain the, the process you go through? Sure, the woodcut process first just begins with the drawing. And it's understanding that it has to be a black and white drawing. And there are various different types of wood that you can use traditionally. Uh, you can have a stronger wood or harder wood if you're going to be printing by hand and some of the softer materials that are much easier uh, to carve uh, go away from wood and you can even use uh, linoleum. I have a preference to use a medium density fiberboard because it's not harsh on my tools. It enables me to give uh, uh, really fast workshops to get people carving right away. Uh, without it being detrimental to the tools, cuts down on the hazardous opportunity for someone cutting themselves, and can really demystify the process and make it accessible uh, for people who just want to learn. And to me, that's been like the largest engagement with woodcut or printmaking as possible, is just making it more accessible to people. Because for the most part, the arts are very intimidating and can be as a deterrent with the heavy process. And this is heavy process, so it is a deterrent. Uh, we have these sharp gouges of the tools that I use that have different heads and of the heads they make a different mark. So I, during my workshops, I'll have an image that I draw up and I encourage others, I show them how to hold the tool and which tool does what for the line work that you're looking for. Uh, the wood makes a big difference. So after I make my drawing on the MDF and I color it black, the next thing I do is I use a water-based acrylic and I coat my block. And that gives it this red look over to it. And the reason why I do that is so whenever I begin to carve away, the negative pops up and it's white. And so it's indicative to me that if I roll ink on the surface right now, the ink is only going to go where it's red and black. The ink is not going to go anywhere where I can now see the natural color of the wood. And you see the way that I carve, I'm holding the tool like a pencil. The tool must be upright where the two beveled edges are up. If you tilt the tool a certain way and you can undercut the wood, what happens is you exceed the depth of the wood and you cause what's called a blowout or flooding when it goes over the line and it actually rips the wood. And that's not a desired aesthetic. So it's all about maintaining the correct angle of the wood and being able to uh, push it through. You see with my left hand, the way I like to carve is that my left hand, as I refer to it as my articulation hand, my left hand guides the tool where I'm going. While my right hand, you see it's all pushing elbow. I never am sore in my forearm or anything. I'm carving like this. When I need to move, it's not proper to break your wrist and try to carve like that. It doesn't make sense when you should just slightly turn the block. Na navigate and negotiate yourself around the block and not to compromise the dexterity of your muscles by doing something and that's what really helps to prevent fatigue. I can carve a block like this in three days. Um, I can carve fast. I can carve with a lot more detail and extreme uh, detail when I take three months to carve on a block. But for me to have that exercise of working with the community and going through the speed, this kind of stuff is fun and it lets my process not be so formulaic into one way of working. Uh, I would never do it images of three seahorses crashing through the waves but for this theme of myths and mysteries and a project such as this this gives me that opportunity to engage in the public and make something fun and not always have to take everything so serious with the heavy heartedness as an artist and to be able to engage like that so this process and being able to cut this fast uh, this is something that is super captivating and I think that people who watch it and get involved and start cutting with me too it's only a matter of time uh, before they uh, get into it and want to give a shot. So I'll have people get the tools and I teach them to use your left hand to help guide, your right hands with the power, and you always want to carve away from yourself because in case you slip, you want to slip that way and you don't want to slip towards yourself. You want to do unto others before yourself. I read that somewhere and it's important that you do that, especially when you're carving. You don't want to cause injury to yourself. And you see at times I'll hit the burr up 
and then I'll use my hand just to rub over it. You don't need gloves, but I like to wear gloves because I wash my hands so much that they dry out. So when I'm carving or anything, I'll just put the gloves on and help out. You can see the areas that I've done around the areas. I sometimes get my smaller tools and I'll guide myself around where I want to uh, carve. So I'm essentially just making myself an outline of where I want the tool uh, to carve. Once I feel that that outline is substantial and is going to prevent me from carving any of my other lines, I can then switch tools and I begin to carve and clear out that area, just really popping up and establishing uh, the white area that I intend to be white. Now this project that I'm doing here at the Art Center, it stems from a larger endeavor that I began uh, over 10 years ago while at grad school at UW-Madison, uh, go Badgers. Uh, my colleague and I, Greg, Nanny and I, while in graduate school getting our Masters of Fine Arts in printmaking, uh, we proposed a thesis project to our committees there at UW to allow us to mobilize a printing press into the back of our vehicle that would retract. And we proposed going to schools across the state and across the Midwest that didn't have visiting artist programs. And we wanted to visit the school, give demonstrations, talk about the history of printmaking, share our artwork, and uh, give a brief lecture on the process. All the while, while pulling up in our press out of the back of our vehicle, printing up prints and t-shirts for people and sharing our love and passion of what we do. And to our surprise, our committee said yes, and we hit the road. And we went to 26 different schools uh, throughout the Midwest, given our presentation. And um, after our thesis was complete, we then got emails from 85 other universities across the country. And then following our graduation, uh, Greg and I continue our endeavor, uh, Drive by Press. And to date, we visited over 245 college campuses across the country, over 100 different community art centers, just like the John Michael Kohler Art Center. And we've amassed over 250,000 miles on the road traveling with Drive By Press. Uh, in doing so, we've also uh, been lucky enough to tour with different indie rock bands and making t-shirts and uh, being able to sell our t-shirts uh, online as vendors at fab.com and uh, a few other different uh, markets. And it's been really uh, engaging and it's been really opportunistic for us, but it's been a really fun adventure to share our passion of what we've done and how we do things and to me one of the most uh, the greatest things I've gotten from these travels is the people who I meet uh, the people who I meet are from all walks of life they appreciate what I do as an artist that I share with them and then they share their stories with me and oftentimes man I meet these artists they just come out the woodworks and they are simply amazing and they'll share some like uh, trade secrets with me uh, you know, and they'll share their artwork with me, and that's just something that I can't put a monetary value on that has been something that has been one of the best uh, benefits or most gratifying aspects to the uh, opportunities that I have and of traveling the country and sharing this work. Now, how did you learn how to, how to do this? Kind of tired? Uh, well, I got out of the military. I was in the military for four years. And I was just taking some uh, English classes. And then when I got out of the military, I had a scholarship opportunity um, and, uh, as an English major. And part of my English major requirement was taking a humanities class and printmaking. I went down into the art department, and I saw a printmaker pull a print right off the block. And it was a process similar to this to where I was walking in to get the professor to sign my ad slip. I see him pull a print through the press, remove the blanket, and then this happens. I see him go and he pulls the block up, boom, from the print. And I saw that reflective image coming up there and it just blew my mind and I said, what is this? And he says, this is printmaking, this is a woodcut. And I said, this is amazing. And he asked me, he said, here, do you want this? And I said, what? I can have this? And he said, yes. 
Look, I'm going to make another one. And he rolled ink on the surface. He put it back on the press. He put a new sheet of paper. He ran it through. And there was something that clicked in my head. There was something like, I appreciated the aesthetic for what the artist had done. But to me, there was something captivating and democratic about the accessibility of that artist willing to share the original. Because I didn't feel like that was a copy. Everyone that comes off is an original. It's not like pressing Apple P in a computer. Every print that comes up is an original. There can be 30 originals, but it's an original. When that artist had that sharing aspect to it, to me, I was captivated by that democratic accessibility. And that's something that ended, just kept on going with me. So after I did that, um, to my parents' dissatisfaction, I no longer sought after uh, my English degree for law school, and I started focusing in on the arts. And uh, they were very disappointed up until I became successful, and then I became a professor myself. Uh, so now they no longer want me to go to law school. <laughs> Are you going to talk about the other pieces that you have here? Sure, I'll talk these. Um, for the community project, it's like the, the, one of the challenges of working in a community project such as this is the range of the demographic of the attendees. And you really have to, as the visiting artist, design a programming that's accessible for people who are tiny to people who are absolutely full grown. So the age of the participants here, the range has been totally off the charts. And so I have to d design programming that would lead to a larger contribution for the end result. I wanted the community to have part of that. But on the same token, I wanted them to learn the process and do something. So it, this wasn't an easy task. And one of the things that I did to help familiarize the community with it is by doing an exquisite corpse. And so I came up with a few different monsters for my myths and mysteries. And I created different sections of the bodies where I did a head, I did a torso, and then I did a feet. And then I could mix them up so I can take off this one who's not wearing any uh, super nice sneakers put a snake tail on it, take the hammerhead out, express that one, uh, this one, my little pigtails there. Oh, this one's my favorite. This is the one with the, uh, the clock around it and the fins. And so we can mix these up, and I show them how we mix them up, and then I give them the opportunity, the community, by placing blank blocks, and then we draw where the, everything connects so we know it's going to fit when we print. And so they're able to carve blocks out themselves and have their own part. And so if they're smaller people that don't have the dexterity to cut, what I generally do is I have them draw and then their parents carve. And so it works collaboratively like that. Uh, or if they're able to draw and carve, I give them a brief carving demonstration, watch along with them and allow them to carve it. Now everyone's not limited to making one of these. They can make their own block. Uh, but in the time that I've been here, there have been about 30 participants who have carved and they've decided to carve their own image and we're able to do it within a three hour period in which we carve and then print. Uh, so this is the exquisite corpse and this is what I found that had been really accessible and like meeting the people halfway. Then shortly after we do this, after the carving, in order to give them the printing demonstration, I have some of my blocks that I've carved uh, that I show them how to ink up and I give them the option to print for a few of my cards. So at the workshop's end, they get to take their block home with them along with their prints on how they've mixed up their exquisite corpse and with one of my prints as well. So it's a nice little exchange and learning opportunity and a nice ephemeral experience uh, for us all. You want to talk about the, the steamroller process? Sure. Yeah. Well, this big carving you're doing now is for that, right? Yeah. All right, the carving that I'm working on right now, there's two of these giant woodcuts that were finished, and I have two previous ones that are complete that we're going to be printing uh, this Saturday and Sunday using a street leveler, or what we call as a st steamroller. And this is a giant 52-inch wide drum that's about six tons. And we roll over the block of wood, and it doesn't, like, blow up the block of wood. The block of wood is solid. 
and we're able to roll ink on the surface. We put a bed sheet over it or a piece of paper, a rubber mat on top, and then we drive the steamroller right over it. Then the pressure of the steamroller transfers the ink from the block straight onto the sheet and we're able to see it. I have a few examples uh, put up that you can see later and show you uh, what those look like, but really to really see the impact of the steamroller, you got to see it because it's not a small piece of metal rolling over. It is giant. And to be able to have that engagement with the public, it's something very performative uh, because they see the block and then when they see the process happening, they, they're like, oh, like a giant stamp. And well, yeah, it's like a giant stamp. Uh, but it's also something that the public's never seen before. And what it does for young artists being able to watch it, it shows them how to expand the limitation of the studio, which you might have just a small press. And it shows you how that that can't dictate your scale and how there are other ways around it using industry and by thinking outside of the box that you can find other ways uh, to reach the scale and the size of the block that you'd like to carve and print. So uh, next Saturday and Sunday, we have about, the objective is to have about 40 prints pulled on each day. We have a variety of bed sheets and colors that we're going to be printing on, and we're going to be raffling them off. And so there will be some that are for uh, sale, but the majority of them is it's so important to me with this process and my visit that as much as possible is accessible to the community and the public. So they are going to be uh, raffled, and there will be some prizes and some contests uh, and to win some of them. So I'm really looking forward to having this event this weekend. But as you see, I have a lot of carving to do. Workshop at one. I'll also be putting some ink out. And so you can see that process in case you stick around. I do gotta meet a buddy for lunch at noon. Oh man, you made it. There you go. Perfect. Sorry about yesterday. We got more fabric, so we're not going to run out today. Yeah, we need to get those set of curves for It's really dry. It's washing so you can do it. Come on. Little mascot of the day.
really close. Just do one more pass and we're good. Okay? The big one? Yeah. And then let's spread it around. With the little rollers, make sure you're getting concentrated on the black. Yeah. yeah. I mean, why?
You want to pick out your shirt? Oh, yeah. Tank top shirt, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.